Welcome to the Home Assistant Podcast. My name is Rohan, and with me today here, I have Phil. Hey, Phil. Hey, how's it going? Good, thank you. And we also have a special guest, Otto. Hey, Otto. Thanks for having me. Yeah, hi. No problem. Thanks for coming on. So, Otto, you are the creator of something that's been stirring up a bit of buzz recently, which is ESP Home Lib, which we're going to pick your brains about later. So, Thank you for your mm-hmm. contribution and sharing fun. it with everyone. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. All right, so the next release we have is 0.72, and I think the big announcement out of 0.72 has to be the new interface, Lovelace, which we'll talk about uh, in, the, in a minute. There's a lot to cover there. But the yes. first one we should go through are the new features. And once again, it's a new release, so new components, which the first one is the Portuguese Weather Service. IPMA uh, has been added to Home Assistant as a weather component. So if you're in Portugal, you can now have your local Portuguese weather as a weather component. So that's great. That's right. Hopefully that brings a little more accuracy or something. Yeah, exactly. Also, Freebox. So if you have a Freebox router, um, you can now use that as a device tracker. So similar to how the other other router integrations work, where you can uh, go in and see if you're home or not based on if your Wi-Fi is connected or not, essentially, or or if your whatever device is on the network. Yeah, I find these a little bit more accurate than you know, just like an Nmap tracker or something like that. Yeah, I'm I'm not a huge fan of the Nmap tracker, to be honest. I I, I love the fact as as a network person, I love the fact that it's an Nmap tracker. Yeah, I I find that it's delayed just because again you're running through a whole lot of stuff, right? Absolutely. Um, and then you're forcing your home assistant to go out and search for everything. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So whereas with something like this, you log right into the router and say, Hey, is you know, MAC address A A B B C C whatever, is that logged in or is that is that connected or not? Yeah, so. exactly. It's just home assistant has one place to check. And that's it. So yeah, I'm a real big fan of the more routers we can get on, the better. So bring it on. I, I completely agree. Another component is IBM Watson's IoT. This will add a new history component for the IBM Watson platform. And it allows tracking of devices and analytics on top of the device data. Yeah, it's really cool. I'm really loving the Watson IoT stuff that can do some really crazy stuff. And I wish I knew more about it, but yeah, I really like seeing all the artificial intelligence stuff. Yeah. I was just checking it out the other day, and it was just amazing how much analytics you can get out of them, out of the platform. Yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. H- have you played with it yet, Otto, or not yet? Uh, a bit. I've been on a presentation about it um, a year ago, and now that it's in Home Assistant, I decided to check it out. And it's you you have just a dashboard where you can see everything and all analytics, and it's it's kind of great. That's very cool. Yeah, that's mm. that's something I've been meaning to play with as well. I just I haven't had the chance to even look at it yet. So, but that's uh, that's definitely probably one of the cooler um, releases. Yeah, something to really watch out for, I think. Yeah, wireless tags platform. So if you've got uh, if you've got wireless tag sensors, then you can now use those. That's cool. Yeah, the the ones from wirelesstag.net. I was actually surprised that this wasn't already added in. I could have sworn these were already supported in the home assistant but once again surprises what's not in there and gets added in not not to confuse it with the generic wireless tag um it's meant for the brand wireless tag yes yes that's true yeah so wireless tag.net if you want to buy any of those new sensors yes <laughs> um <laughs> now uh, another actually we're just speaking about uh, the freebox routers netgear lte component has been added in which adds support for the LB2120 LTE modem. Now, this is really cool because I've always thought in my home, you know, what happens if my internet drops out? You know, I'd like a a 4G backup modem connection, you know? Mm -hmm. And now there's this support. So, and this actually adds some pretty cool stuff. So, if you're using this LTE modem, it can send an SMS from the router to say, you know, hey, your internet's dropped out, I've switched over to 4G. There you go. It also has a sensor with the number of unread SMS messages which have been sent to the SIM card attached to that modem, which is really cool. And also it has a sensor which will show you how much uh, data you've used from that modem. So if it is like, you know, obviously 4G data is a bit more expensive than your landline connection at home. So you can monitor how much data you're using on that LTE modem. 
So that's uh, a very cool component to have, I think. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things where it's, you know, if you're starting to go, let's say in, in, in the example you use, let's say your primary internet goes out and you're using an LTE backup now, you're almost, it gives you a little more control and visibility into that, uh, into that modem, right? Uh, rather than having to log into that box and such already, um, if you already got Home Assistant open, then then you're good there. So you can just have a peek and say, oh, you know, I've got maybe you know, a gig left in my bandwidth cap, right? So. Yeah, which would actually go also well with the next component, which is Uptime Robot. Yeah. Uh, UptimeRobot.com. Once again, a service I didn't know existed, but I installed the Home Assistant beta and saw that in the release notes. Took a look and, uh, yeah, now it's already monitoring uh, at least the Home Assistant podcast website for us. <laughs> and I also hooked it up to uh, monitor my Home Assistant. So every 30 minutes, Uptime Robot will go out to my Duck DNS and check that my Home Assistant is still accessible from the outside world. Oh, neat. Yeah. Yeah. So you could combine this with an LTE modem and then detect, oh, my main internet connection's down. Maybe I need to try and connect another way. Yeah, and and there's a few services like this. There's like uh, I'm trying to remember what they're called, like Pingdom and yeah, Pingdom. Yeah, it was a major one. Yeah, a, a few others. I can't think of them at the top of my head right now. But yeah, so that's uh, it's another one of those kind of services, which is which is great, right? I mean, if you can integrate that right into your into your home assistant, so the the perfect use case in a home assistant world is something like what you said, right? Where mm. hey, my home assistant might be down. Let me trigger an action on something. Right. Yeah, exactly. So now if the House Podcast website goes down at 1 a.m., I can get the lights to turn on and wake me up, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Code red, code red. <laughs> <laughs> also, we've uh, added support for the Kiwi door locks. Um, so if you're if you're not familiar with that, uh, which I wasn't, um, it's just another door lock, uh, like electronic locking system, right? So Yeah, it looks very similar to August. Yeah, which is uh, which is interesting. So it's a uh, it's uh, it's it's neat because it looks like the August, but it doesn't at the same time. It's it's almost like a little. Uh, it's it's the handle, right? So I yes, think exactly. It, yeah, I think what you buy is yeah. So you buy the handle, and uh, that's got the lock built into it. So pretty cool. Um, also, yeah. a new fuel sensor for people living in New South Wales, Australia. So the New South Wales government in Australia actually has an API where people can query a fuel price in their area, which is awesome. I'm actually in Victoria, so I don't have access to that data, unfortunately. But yeah, that's really cool. So now you can get Home Assistant to alert you when the fuel price is low in your weekly cycle and go out and buy petrol now while it's cheap. <laughs> that's cool. I, I'd, I'd love to see, there's there's so many services. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you guys have any of those services, but there's crowdsource services as well that that we have access to here. Um, mm. one, one locally, I think is called, uh, gas buddy, which is, which I, I believe is local to the GTA, uh, the greater Toronto area, uh, Metro essentially. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if they expand into the U S or to other things, but I'd love to see that. Right. Cause it's like, you know, even if it, if, even if it's has that pushes you a notification that says, yeah, exactly. Hey, go fill up your gas. Right. So GTA. I know at least here in Australia, there's, um, a website called motormouth.com.au. And I think they actually use people to go out and um, either petrol stations will self-report or they'll actually get people to go out and check the price. But um, I don't think they expose an API. In ways, there is um, people can also crowd report yeah. gas prices as well. Exactly. Which I don't know. Yeah. If I ever, I've never done that because it's too hard to do while you're driving. But Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same. <laughs> same. Yeah. It's, it's, which is, which is interesting, right? Because, because these other apps, they, Obviously, they're like, "Hey, please don't use this app while you're driving." But then they they make it super easy for you to do. If you look exactly. at the design, it, it's definitely meant for you to use when you're driving. It's like, obviously, they have to have that legal statement in there. It's like, uh, okay. <laughs> I, I, usually, I'll do it when I pull into a gas station. And I'm like, okay, I'll I'll report the prices for for things. But but yeah, not not while I'm driving. Um, also, Phil, this should make you happy. Xiaomi cameras. Um, to, to integrate into Home Assistant. Uh, so you do need a custom firmware on the device. I don't, I don't know if you've got a chance to play with this or, or if you have any high Xiaomi cameras, but... No, I haven't got any Xiaomi camera. Like, cameras are the, the next big... The, they're the scary thing for me, but they're also yeah. the thing that everyone keeps talking about and they're doing some cool stuff with. Like, yeah, 
Yeah, I, I think it's going to take a little bit to convince the other home users that having something watching you is a good idea. You know what? I I kind of share that sentiment. I I outside the house, I have no problems putting up. Like I can line the outside of my house with cameras. I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. The inside, I'm like, ah, that's kind of creepy. Like that, yeah. to some extent. And yes, you know what? Even even from an infosec perspective and stuff like that, I I trust myself. But especially when it's cloud connected ones and stuff, like definitely I would I would not personally I would not do um, like an Arlo or or a Nest camera or one of those that are cloud connected. If anything, yeah. if I'm doing it internally, it has to be uh, local. And it, it's just it's just my paranoia for, for for whatever reason. Right? It just just weirds me out. It's bad enough that I have like I'm in my home office. I have, you know, between my video devices, between my video uh, video calling devices, and uh, all my laptops having cameras all facing towards me at the same time. And I've got two video devices in my in my home office, so it's like uh, okay. And even those I keep closed, right? So yeah, I think that's one of the the pro points to these custom firmwares on the Xiaomi's is that once you put the custom firmware on, there's no and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, just email me at the feedback at Has Podcast. But you, once you've put the custom firmware on, there's no reliance on the cloud. So then you can just um, block them from their router from ever accessing the internet. And then you can go through and use the Home Assistant proxy camera to then view the feed in Home Assistant or record it to a local NVR if you want to. So that is the only reason I would ever want a camera in my house. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, and then at that point, you you start doing things like blocking full internet access for that camera as well, and all that. Yeah, exactly. Stuff. So, yeah, it's it's yeah, it, it definitely requires consideration, and it's not it's not for everybody. Uh, putting cameras inside the house, um, I I would love to do it from a security perspective, but the the, the weirdness factor. <laughs> Also yeah. plays well, in imagine if you had that. Remember a couple of episodes ago, you were talking about how um, your motion sensors got detected because of your Rimba was cleaning the house. Imagine <laughs> if you had a, yeah. a camera in there, you would have had to pull around on a tollway and check what was going on at home. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have needed to turn around and pay twice the tolls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Um, and lastly, for the new components uh, this week, uh, there's two new com- media player components. Uh, one is for Epson projectors. That's cool. And also uh, Unity Media as well. So if you use the Horizon HD recorder box. Uh, with the Unity Media box, it's also important that uh, in if you happen if you happen to live in Austria, they're called UPC, Horizon HD recorder. It's... Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. It's a big company that has mm. different names all over Europe. Ah, oh, nice. Okay, that's a good tip to know. Yeah. Also, some uh, breaking changes. Uh, we added support for multiple Doorbird stations. Uh, so if you've got a Doorbird station or, or a few, uh, well, regardless, you will you might need to tweak your config a little bit. Mm. Another one, um, airvisual.com. So the air visual sensor in Home Assistant has removed the radius parameter. So the unique IDs will um, also be changed a little bit. So they'll include um, region uh, prefixes as well. So uh, when you restart Home Assistant, if you're using air visual, those entity IDs may change. So just watch out for that. Yeah. And this one might affect a few more people. Uh, If you have a Nest, Sonos, or uh, a Cast, you will now have to configure it using config entry. Um, so there's, there's, uh, documentation around that. Um, you can, you can use it via the integrations page, um, but have a look at the documentation and, uh, fix that. So if you're, if you're missing those, that's probably why. Yeah. I think this is more move, once again, standardizing everything and getting it more in the user interface as opposed to configuration, like YAML files and all that. So a good, good move in the right direction. I think with Cast and Sonos, it's currently even just deprecated. You can still use it uh, with the old configuration. They're just telling you that it will be removed in some time. You know, that actually explains it because I upgraded uh, to the beta and when I was uh, looking over the broken changes and I saw Sonos, I was like, huh, why am I still able to use my Sonos if I haven't updated the config? But that makes sense. Yeah, it's legacy. So it's not, yeah. not necessarily a breaking change, but it's a change that will affect you. Yeah, exactly. 
I thought I thought I saw something where uh, might have been on Reddit or might have been on the forums or somewhere uh, where a couple of people weren't able to uh, access the devices because uh, they were running it through Discovery and a few few other things. So I'm not sure if this will this will play into that. No, it won't. Um, I don't I don't know what came, what came out of that, but you will still have to do it manually uh, if you are using. Um... Uh, if you if discovery doesn't work for you, but um, it's still possible with the new cast yeah. component. And the last in bed attribute has been removed from the eight sleep component because um, it wasn't being updated accurately. So if you're relying on that last in bed attribute, um, it's going to be removed when you upgrade to zero point seven two. So watch out for that one. Oh, interesting. Okay, and uh, TP Link LB whatever light bulbs uh, will now report in kilowatt hours so that it's consistent with everything else. So if you're doing things like graphing it and stuff, you may you may notice your graph looks a little off. Yeah, that's interesting. Some people doing uh, long term trends on that that might mm-hmm. get a little bit tricky, especially if you're pushing it out to a Grafana or something. Yeah, yes. exactly. Which I guess if you if you we needed to do that, you could use a template sensor to bring it back to its previous reading. Yeah, convert them and yeah. Um, some other noteworthy changes, and of course, we first of all have to um, have a correction from last week's episode uh, where I was talking about the Nest estimated arrival time. Um, I actually stated that it was uh, calculated by Nest themselves, and that you could tap in to their artificial intelligence. That's actually not true. Um, thanks, uh, Jason, for reaching out on the Discord room just to give us that little correction. There are a lot of um, works with Nest apps and components that you can use with Nest, and Home Assistant is now one of those. And starting with 0.72, there's a new service called Nest Set Mode Service, and that allows you to, um, well, basically allows Home Assistant to tell Nest what it thinks your estimated time of arrival will be, and then Nest can then push that out to other services that integrate with Nest Ah, and let the other services know, you know, I think this person's going to be home in 20 minutes. So slowly start warming up the house now. Right. So, so it's kind of the other way, not, not. uh, Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's you telling Nest what the estimated time of arrival is. Right. Right. Moving on. uh, Insteon integration now supports X10. That's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. X10 is still a thing. I thought X10 had died long ago. I yeah, I guess you know you know what it's. Uh, I'm sure people still have X10 devices that you know it's been kicking around. Um, yeah, I think I've got one that I don't even know if still works. I you know what we we used to use the remote control like turn on off thing like years ago. Um, I remember X10 used to give uh, like actually X10 used to give those things out for free sometimes like oh, once wow. a year or something they'd be like hey you know just click here and you can get something like, you know like a remote switch thing for free or something like that and i i've done that a couple of times my my family had a couple <laughs> growing up and then you know this is I, I don't even know i don't even know what happened to those either we threw those out or or i don't know they went my, for my first somehow. foray into home automation was a little uh, IR receiver that would receive an infrared signal from a remote, like a TV remote, and would then yes. um, turn off two lamp modules via X10 next to the TV. So I would turn the TV on, it would then send an IR blast to the X10 IR receiver, which would then turn on two lamps next to the TV. That was it. That's when I was still living with my parents. That was it. That was my first foray into home automation. And now I don't think those things do. I probably still have them somewhere because I you know, don't want to throw anything away, but yeah. I doubt they still work. That's awesome. The color status sensor for Nest Protect is now available in Home Assistant as a sensor. Now, the uh, so this is when you're looking at your Nest Protect, there'll be some colors on the Protect. It could be, you know, mm-hmm. orange, red, green, just to, and there can be a range of things. You know, it might be, you might flash red to say, hey, the battery is critically low, you need to replace it. You can actually get that color that the light is in Home Assistant. So then you can trigger some automations based on that. That's cool. I, I don't I don't know why that seems that seems really small, but that's really cool. Yeah, that's cool. Um, um, so yeah, I've I've personally got a couple of those uh, Nest Protect, so I might uh, I might give that a shot. Um, also, uh, the Ring component uh, now supports OAuth, so um, you should be able to just log in uh, and use the Ring doorbells and such now for with with Home Assistant. I saw a few comments on the um, on Reddit today saying, "Yes, I can finally use Ring again! Yay!" <laughs> yeah. 
So I think we need to uh, talk about uh, the new Lovelace UI, which uh, has come out with 0.72. It's a new experimental UI. I guess it's a a beta uh, UI for Home Assistant, which brings some really cool stuff to Home Assistant. Have you guys tried it yet? I haven't tried it. I I looked at it, but Otto, I don't know if you tried it yet or... Yeah, I just tried it this morning and it's quite amazing, I would say. Yeah, I, I really like... Uh, previously, if you wanted to customize your front end with Home Assistant, you would have to use groups and then use groups mm-hmm. and other groups together and create views. Yeah. With Lovelace, it now is all contained in a Lovelace UI YAML file and you define your view groups in the Lovelace YAML file, which allows Home Assistant to have groups for the UI and you can then use normal home assistant groups to actually group devices together. For example, you might want to group the office lights together and then call them a group or group people together as you would, and then have the UI display them mm-hmm. completely separately. So that's cool. But I think the the main feature for me is once you edit the Lovelace uh, YAML file, there's a little refresh button in the corner. You just click that. You don't have to restart yeah, home amazing. assistant or anything yeah, like that. It just that's cool. reloads the UI. Yeah. Because it, I don't know about you guys, but restarting Home Assistant for me can take a good yes. five, ten minutes, just with all the components I'm running, and it gets you yeah, very frustrating when you need to update the UI. Yeah, that's the game changer. Yeah, yeah, that's that's huge. Yeah, you're you're running it on a Pi, right, uh, Phil? Uh, I'm actually running it on my Synology, but I have so many things now running through my Synology that it's really starting to affect home assistant. So I've got, you know, mm. Plex running on home on the Synology. I've got, you know, other Docker containers running, you know, Influx, MySQL. It yeah, all, yeah. you know, it's all competing for resources. So Yeah. Yeah. So so that that might be why. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the things why I think everybody should check this out is um also the new glances card so where you can just put a lot of entities into a single grid and uh, because previously you had to have this these huge lists in home assistant uh, which took lots of space and now you can pretty easily just put them in a grid and it's with a lot less space and mm-hmm. and i think also what's really uh, nice about this uh, lovelace uh, ui is, is also that you can have a single card that lists all entities because previously that was just very difficult with the default view and all that. Yeah, exactly. And there's actually a few, um, so obviously Lovelace, this is the very first release of Lovelace. So there's a few things that are going to be missing, but there's also some really cool new types of cards that you can add. One of those is the picture entity card Mm -hmm. where you can have a, it's really cool where you can have, you know, just a picture that, displays you know, it can be a picture of anything and then you click it and it does you know it changes i think um one of the examples it goes from black and white to color to denote that it's been turned on yeah so really cool yeah there's new docs for it too that that kind of go through how all that stuff works yeah marius um has done some great stuff describing what you can do we'll leave a link to that in the show notes but yeah like pictures glances there's uh, even markdown support in some alert boxes now. So if you're familiar with GitHub and bolding words and making things italic, that's now supported in those glances, uh, sorry, those cards as well. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, oh, and actually one other feature is, so you can have uh, little tabs in Lovelace as you would with normal Home Assistant, but each tab can have its own theme. So you could have the kitchen being a black you know, night theme, and then the living room in the normal home assistant blue white theme, and then another room in a different theme. So that's actually really cool as well. Yeah, that is pretty neat. So yeah, some great uh, work being done there. So thank you to everyone who's been working on Lovelace. We really appreciate it. Yeah, that's uh, that's very cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So so one of the other uh, one of the other things that uh, that we're that's happened is the uh, home assistant cloud. Um, so if everybody remembers, it was on a beta. Um, that's that's a service that you use to to connect to um, Amazon or Google, things like that for things like your voice assistants and such for for native integration into Home Assistant. So that beta has been uh, extended until September. So. 
Yeah, so people have been asking, you know, oh, when do we have to start paying for the Home Assistant's cloud support, which is actually part of the community support package. So the beta has been extended until September 2018, so there's no payments required until at least then. And then mm-hmm. we'll start be looking forward to people that are subscribing to the community support package, and that will then throw in Home Assistant Cloud as well. Yes. Um, and also, if you are a fan of HASS.io or you want to help contribute to where HASS.io and eventually Hass OS is going to move to, there's been a call for donations for hardware or even money to buy hardware for Hass, HASS.io. So if you can um, help out the guys working on HASS.io, that would be great. We'll leave a link to the GitHub issue and you can either suggest some new hardware that you would like to see HASS.io supported on or even send some money over to all the guys working on HASS.io. All right. And uh, one of the other things uh, is, so the, the text-to-speech script for the Amazon Echo, let's call it, uh, for, for Home Assistant. Uh, so we, we mentioned this briefly uh, at some point. In the last and, episode, yeah. Yeah, so this this exists. So somebody somebody put this together uh, for, I believe it was Open Hab. Correct. Um, and essentially it's a script that goes in, logs in. It's, it's, a, it's a shell script that'll go in, log into to your Amazon dev account, uh, or I guess it's just your Amazon uh, Echo account. And then it'll actually push, you know, say, it'll put ask it to say, hey, say, uh, you know, hello, Phil, how are you today through your Echo? Yeah, so um, yeah. I actually... Uh, Went ahead and uh, I was really excited for this. I was like, oh, I, I need to get this working. I actually uh, have a little uh, script that I uh, can work now. So let me, I have a, an echo dot here on my desk. Let me just uh, fire off this script for you. You guys can hear it. Let's have a listen. Mm-hmm. Hello, Home Assistant Podcast. So that is coming out of the echo dot on my desk here. I didn't have to wake up the echo. I didn't have to press any buttons on the echo dot. And it was all uh, pushed through uh, Home Assistant. So uh, that's really cool if you have, you know, and these things are cheap, right? You know, 30 bucks US. So if this script can stabilize, people can use these as mm-hmm. little text-to-speech announcement gadgets everywhere. Yeah, exactly. So so the, the, there, there is a caveat behind this, which is, again, it's going in and it's using, it's essentially... It, it's the same, the script, all the script is doing is the same as you logging into the browser and typing in those words right so uh, yeah yeah from from a not necessarily a scale perspective but from a perspective of you know if amazon changes something on their end something like that then this may possibly break right and in which case you'd you know you'd have to wait for an update <laughs> or 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 pray uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and, exactly. and so so there there is a caveat behind there right but uh i mean for for its feature functionality it's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of this. And especially for, the, and there's quite a few people. Uh, I know you use it, Phil. Carlo uses it. There's a lot of people that we've talked to that have multiple talkback systems. So if you're talking to, you would talk to the to the Echo. If you're talk, if you're if it's talking to you, you'd go through another system. I think in your case, you're using your Sonos, if I'm not mistaken. Correct, yes. Yeah, so this might replace that. Yeah, well, hopefully one day. I I found a couple of um, quirks. So with the script, I had to just comment out in the script that is posted on Reddit. They remove a cookie file. I had to comment that out. So uh, special thanks to uh, CMIL on Reddit for giving me that idea. Once I commented that out, I got the script working. I found that I can't run the script properly in my Docker container for Home Assistant. Um, so mm-hmm. the original script oh. relies on the JQ library to exist in your Linux install. The standard Home Assistant Docker images and HASS.io images as well don't include that. There was a non-JQ version of the script posted in the Reddit thread. I found when I used that, though, I can't target the right echo dot. So I have my office dot and I have another dot in the kitchen. Using the non-JQ version will only ever... Uh, send text to speech to the kitchen dot, for example. Right. So, yeah, so it's still, you know, very much a work in progress. These aren't bad things, you know, this is what you've got to expect and people are working on it. You know, I didn't pay anything for this, so I, I really appreciate all the hard work that people are doing. But, you know, there are some 
caveats to using this. Uh, another thing I noticed was for anyone familiar developing with the Amazon Echo, they might be used to uh, speech icons or the speech markup language, which basically allows she who shall not be named to really say some things excitingly, you know, like watch out or good luck in no sort of tones. Right. But this script doesn't support anything like that. So you'll just have to watch out for that. And also, I don't know if it's how the script is working. I, th I believe it was originally discovered by someone finding um, through the German uh, Amazon Echo portal that this was available. But I found that some words, when even if I've selected uh, English US in the script, she will actually talk to me in German. So, <laughs> um, for example, if I tell her to say friend, she'll give me the German word for friend. So Interesting. It's n yeah, it's still, you know, very much a work in progress. And it may be, this is probably because it's using something unofficial from Amazon, but I think it's still yeah a little bit of work in progress to go there. But yes, very th uh, big shout out to Ralph Otto and Michael Gurham for uh, doing all the hard work on this. Yeah, that's awesome. So, I, I, I mean, it comes down to this, right? If you're, if there's some functionality you're looking for and if you're okay with, with the caveats there and you know what, give it a shot. Even if you're not okay with the caveats, give it a shot anyways and, <laughs> and, and see if it works out for you, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you, you might pick up some German along the way too, so. Yeah, it might come in handy. That's right. So, uh, Otto, uh, thank you very much for joining us on Home Assistant podcast today. Um, we'd love to hear um, all about how you're using Home Assistant, but uh, as we mentioned before, you are the creator of ESP HomeLib. Exactly, yeah. I created ESP HomeLib some time ago, and since then, I've been working quite hard on it. And, well, now it's quite popular, I would say. Yeah, it's been very yeah. popular. So, w what is ESP HomeLib and why does it exist? So ESP HomeLib is a solution for using the small ESP8266 or ESP32 microcontrollers with Home Assistant. Um, you, if you do not know these microcontrollers, they're just basically these cheap Arduino-style Wi-Fi boards that you can buy for $5 or so. And... Um, Usually the problem is how uh, how you can integrate them into Home Assistant because you need to download some firmware and uh, flash it onto the device and go through some weird setup procedure. And ESP HomeLib tries to reinvent this whole process a bit. Um, ESP HomeLib uh, tries to um, display everything in a nice UI and uh, also... Uh, make everything user configurable through um, a simple YAML configuration. And yeah, I hope uh, it makes people use these ESPs more. Yeah, it's definitely made me want to find out what, more about these ESP things. I think, Rohan, you just bought a couple, didn't you? Yeah, I did. So <laughs> so it's really funny. And I think I was telling you this, Phil, offline is uh, yeah. this, this, so ESP HomeLib came out, I think, like a day after I finished putting all my stuff together. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so this is bad, bad, bad timing on my part, I guess. But uh, no, yeah, it's it's definitely, definitely, definitely very cool. Um, for for those listening, check it out if you haven't. Um, it's a great way to, great, cheap and easy way to make sensors. And a lot of libraries and stuff, if you want to make them nice, a lot of libraries and stuff, at least around here, have 3D printers and such. So Oh, nice. uh, you know, if you need to make covers and, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. So, so what can someone do with uh, an ESP and your library right now? So um, if they download the HES.io add-on or the uh, whole ESP HomeLib uh, Python package, they can basically just create a simple YAML configuration file and upload it to the ESP. And afterwards, um, they can connect all sorts of sensors, uh, uh, temperature sensors or uh, voltage sensors, um, and they will automatically automatically show up in Home Assistant. And that's more or less what ESP HomeLib does. Nice. That's cool. So, 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 what's going on behind the scenes there? So behind the scenes. Um, there is this uh, whole C++ library called ESP HomeLib, uh, which uh, 
well, sets up the Wi-Fi connections and does all the magic and um, the mm -hmm. stuff that you see usually when you're editing the YAML files is ESP Home YAML, uh, a project on top of ESP Home Lib that converts, that reads in the YAML configuration files, does some basic pre-processing and converts it to a, a custom uh, C++ firmware, uh, which you can also edit a bit. And that's more or less what's happening. And also on top of that, then there's also the dashboard, which you can see in the SAO add-on and which provides some basic access to logs and all that stuff. That's, that's very cool. And I see you're adding support for the Magic Cards project soon too. Exactly, yeah. I, I just received that card um, one day and I thought, well, I have some time now and, and this Magic Cards project is so great um, that... Yeah, I decided to implement it and it was relatively easy. So um, I think you can see it in 1.8.0 of, of ESP Homelip. It will be quite fun. Nice. So I'm guessing someone will be able to buy an ESP, an RFID reader, and then they would be able to just load it all up and not have to worry about touching any lines of code and they would have the Magic Cards project running. Exactly, yeah. And then you can just press any, uh, register all kinds of uh, NFC tags or F RFID tags and uh, they will show up in Home Assistant as binary sensors. And based on that, you can then trigger automations and play music and what whatnot. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Great uh, great job, first of all, Otto. Like, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so, so tell tell us a little bit about about yourself. How long have you been using Home Assistant, um, and and like how long have you been into home automation and these kind of things? So I started using home automation, I think, about four to five years ago. First, using this Open Hub project, and I just basically had the goal of automating my uh, own room uh, with some uh, RGB lights and. Well, some basic stuff, uh, but uh, this open hub tool I used was, uh, I thought, quite ugly and uh, not very <laughs> extensible. I, I really wanted to have more API access and all that stuff. So then I saw this Reddit post of somebody saying that Home Assistant is the future, and I really loved the material design. And since then, I'm I'm a big Home Assistant user. <laughs> Yeah, that's, right. That's so cool. Um, so, so you, you, how long? How long has it been since you've been using Home Assistant now? Specifically, um, I'm not entirely sure. I think so. I think two to three years. I would say. Um, yeah, and I'm just okay. using it on a simple nice. uh, Docker machine um, on an old computer, uh, laying around somewhere in in the. Uh, in the so we were talking just before the episode. One thing people may not know about you seeing, you know, talking about Docker and using OpenHab. You, you, how old are you, Otto? I'm 18 years old. I think not too many people expect that, but yeah, um, I yeah <laughs> I just yeah. finished high school, and so yeah, I'm, that's amazing. So you know, we we have a a few people on the a few guests have come on the show talking about how you know they they're changing their home automation system to do things for like getting their children ready for school mm -hmm. and all that. And here's you automating your own, you know, I'm guessing your room in your parents' yeah. house and then maybe stepping out and automating your parents' house and doing it yeah, the I mean, opposite way. Uh, the, I have kind of a conservative approach to automations because I don't want to teach my parents how to use Home Assistant and all these automations because I'm sure they won't get it. Uh, so I'll just... I, I usually just uh, do the automations that are really basic, like um, uh, turning the, uh, putting the window blinds down if it's very hot outside. And uh, well, we have a humidity problem in our house, so we I set up an automation that uh, turns on the dehumidifiers if uh, the humidity reaches a certain level and it's night and yeah, some other conditions. Yeah, that's awesome. So, how are you running Home Assistant? You mentioned you've got Docker. Is it on a on a fancy server, or is it just on a Raspberry Pi? No, it's Pi? nothing fancy. It's just an old computer. I think it's even eight or nine years old now, um, and I just converted it to oh, a nice. home server with Debian, and that's working quite fine. 
That's cool. So what, what components are you using in your in your smart home? Like, are you using Hues, LifeX, any Z-Wave stuff? Uh, well, uh, I mean, I'm not so... I don't... Uh, I don't have so much money to buy all these huge things. And yeah, all that. yeah. So my approach to uh, home assistant is more like um, if I can get something to work uh, so without buying anything, that's great. Otherwise, I'll just try to use these ESPs to uh, to hack something into my home. But otherwise, I, I don't buy anything for my home, uh, any expensive stuff. Yeah, no, that's cool. So, so what kind of uh, what kind of stuff have you built with uh, with the ESPs? Uh, well, like I said, I have my own cabinets for in my own room where I have all my clothes and um, I have RGB lights all there and as uh, a cover that goes uh, up when I'm standing in front of the uh, the cabinet. But otherwise, uh, just lots of data gathering, like uh, how. Uh, how hot it is in different rooms and yeah basically i'm just using home assistant mostly to just track data and um, maybe gain some insights very cool well that's awesome and the, you mentioned before opening and closing blinds is that something you built yourself with the, an esp yeah exactly um i have a small motor connected to an esp and using esp home lip i i've automated it in such a way that um, as I said, it opens up when I'm in front of the cover, and that's quite cool. Yeah, that's really cool. So what would you describe your favorite uh, automation in Home Assistant as? What's something you're, you're really proud of that you've automated? Well, I don't have really that many uh, big automations. I don't do really anything fancy, but I would say what I, I'm really proud of, one thing that I did um, half a year ago, um, we had... We wanted to buy a new heat pump because our old um, old system with oil was getting quite old. And so a company approached us and they said uh, they wanted to have it for about twice the price that we expected. And so my father and I um, sat down and used the data that I had gathered before on all the weather and um, uh, heat uh, heat. Uh, data to just kind of see um, which heat pump would work best for us and so in the end we got down to I think a fourth of the price that they were suggesting and uh, that was quite that saved a lot of money using home assistant. That's awesome That's awesome. Wow Yeah. <laughs> wow I wish I was uh, doing stuff like that when I was 18. Yeah I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my 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 uh it, when I was 18 it was definitely different. I was definitely just going out and not being intelligent. <laughs> wow. All right, well, thank you very much for joining us Otto. We um we're really pleased with uh the way uh ESP HomeLib is really helping people uh get into using those ESP hardwares and using them with Home Assistant. So, thank you very much for all your contributions. Definitely. We will leave links in the show notes where people can download ESP Home Lib um, and all that fancy stuff that you're working on. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Otto. Yeah, no, this is great. Yeah. Awesome work, man. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers.